Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenatata Kautu, Core uh, Paul Brunton, I hope. Uh, my name's Paul Brunton, and I have the privilege to be the PVC Val Sciences, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here tonight to Gillian's inaugural professorial lecture, which I'm sure we're all look for, looking forward to. Now, normally the VC would be here and do the official welcome, but unfortunately she couldn't be here, and she did desperately want me to send her apologies. Um, She's unfortunately committed elsewhere, Julian, so she's very sorry that she couldn't be here because we always enjoy these IPL events. They're the highlight of the academic year. To see our colleagues promoted is a fantastic thing and it's a great way for them to introduce themselves to their community in their new role as a professor. And it's an opportunity to celebrate your success and I'm sure it will go very, very well. To become a professor in this university is a task in itself. We've just done the professorial promotion round for this year and it is a very difficult process, I have to say, and therefore to succeed through that process is testament to the quality of your research, your teaching and your contributions to service and it's richly deserved. So I look forward to hearing your lecture and again welcome everybody to this evening and particularly those joining us on Zoom from afar, you're very, very welcome and I'm sure you'll enjoy the evening. And without more ado, I'll pass over to David to say a few words. Just checking you can hear, I think it's... Yes, can you hear? The microphone just... Great. Tēnā um, koutou katoa. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name's David Murdoch. I'm the, the Dean and Head of Campus here at the University of Otago in Christchurch. And one of my great pleasures in my role is to, is to introduce um, all of our inaugural professorial lecturers. And, and it's a great privilege to, to be able to introduce Gillian tonight. As many of us know, Gillian um, originally comes from South Africa, but probably not all of us would know that she actually had a career before she went into public health. Gillian trained as a, a medical technologist, and for in New Zealand parlance, we'd call a medical laboratory scientist now. And she uh, trained in medical technology at Grutuskura Hospital in Cape Town, graduating in 1981, and for a few years after that was a, a, a medical technologist specialising in haematology in the Cape Town area. 1996, she and her family migrated to New Zealand and then she tells me she decided she needed a change in career and the following year in 1997 she joined uh, what was then the, our Department of uh, Public Health and General Practice. First as a research fellow then as an assistant research fellow, junior research fellow, um, research fellow, lecturer, senior lecturer, etc. And during that time, uh, also studied uh, uh, public health. So postgraduate diploma in public health, master in public health, and then PhD, all here on this campus, graduating with a PhD in 2010. Um, in um, about 2013, the department uh, split into Department of General Practice and the Department of and, well, Public Health became the Department of Population Health and uh, Gillian was our inaugural head of department uh, of, in the Department of po uh, Population Health and has held that role ever since. And during her time with us has really developed quite an extensive record as a, as a teacher, as a postgraduate supervisor and, and at times has contributed to our medical program. Gillian's research expertise is in community-based participatory approaches using mixed methods to look at vulnerable populations. And when we're talking about vulnerable populations, we're looking here at those groups who are marginalised or excluded in society, including sex workers, particular groups of young people, such as those in foster care, and people living with HIV infection, and Gillian's worked with all of those groups. And I think it's fair to say that uh, she has been a, a major force in, in our, behind our strength and qualitative research here on the Christchurch campus. Gillian is most well known for her expertise in the field of research on sex work and is really a, a genuine world leader and world opinion leader in this area. 
New Zealand became the first country to, to decriminalise sex work in 2003 when the, the Prostitution Reform Act was passed. And Gillian was the lead investigator uh, following that um, uh, with a project, large national project funded by the Health Research Council looking at the impact of the Act on the health and safety of sex workers. And that piece of work and, and other work that she has led have been hugely influential both here in New Zealand and globally. She has developed an extensive uh, global network of collaborators and uh, recently, with some of those collaborators, has received funding from the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK to do a four-country comparative study investigating sexual violence in sex working populations with a focus on legal consciousness, legal norms and legal practice. As a global opinion leader, she's often called upon uh, to the media, and I very, very much, very well remember about five years ago uh, a debate that she held online with the New York Times on should, whether prostitution, prostitution should be a crime. In her lecture, Gillian's going to take us through her journey through her sex work research over the past 23 years and highlighting key public health messages. So, Gillian, I welcome you to the stage. Tanakota Katoa, thank you so much for coming along to listen to me talk about my research journey in sex work. Um, it's been a very long and ple pleasant journey and I'm hoping to take you on a trip through sex work tonight. Um, but I thought before I got started I'd give you, I'd just embellish a bit on some of the, the my pre-sex work life um, as, and highlight some of the things that David had had already said. So I was born in Cape Town and I spent the first 36 years of my life there. But my roots go back to England, so um, my father's parents were from London and they emigrated to what was then southern Rhodesia, it's now Zimbabwe, um, just shortly before he was born. And there's my son, he's just arrived. <laughs> um, so they emigrated to um, southern Rhodesia and just when he was a young boy they moved down to Cape Town. Then when he was 19 he went up to North Africa to fight in the Second World War and he was there for um, about a year and a half before he was captured by the Germans and he, that was in December 1941. He spent the rest of the war in POW camps, in it, mainly in Italy and then towards the end of the war in Germany. Um, after the war they sent him across to England and he was in a camp in Brighton where he was waiting to be shipped back to South Africa and it was there in Brighton that he met my mother who was born in Brighton. Um, so he was shipped back to Cape Town within a few months my mother followed him and four days after she arrived in Cape Town they got married and that's the photo on their right on the right taken on their wedding day. So they very quickly had three children quick succession and for almost 10 years they thought their family was complete. They had my two sisters and my brother. And then 1960 arrived and surprise, so did I. <laughs> and um, yeah, they got used to me after a while. Um, and the picture at the bottom is a picture of my mother and I on Brighton Beach. When I was four years old, we sailed across to England to visit the family in Brighton. So I grew up in a suburb called Pinemans in Cape Town. Pinemans was quite a, a lovely suburb to grow up in. And it's got three primary schools which feed one high school. And the primary schools are very imaginatively called the Red School, the Blue School and the Green School. And I went to the Red School as my siblings had done before me. Um, and then obviously on to Pinemans High School. And the pictures there are my first year of school and the uh, other one's my last year in school. I did enjoy school, I've got some pleasant memories of it, mainly because that's where my friends were. Um, but I did okay academically as well. But it got towards the end of school and I didn't really know what I was going to do after I left school. I had no strong vocational calling. But my sister-in-law um, worked in the, as a medical technologist at Kruitsky Hospital and she took me around to see the labs and I thought this will do. And I applied to get into medical technology. Um, but it was quite a, a thing to get in, so they had a capped amount of students they would take every year, and the year that I was going, 1978, they'd capped it at 12. 
and there were 110 applicants, so I thought I better have a backup plan. And somebody told me about radiography, so I applied for that. And I got in, but I had to keep it on hold for a while until I heard back from medical technology and I got my letter and that I'd been accepted. And so I started in 1978 at Krutsky Hospital. Well, it was Krutsky Hospital and the medical school. So two of the labs were in the medical school. That was histology and bacteriology. And then hematology and chemical pathology were in the hospital. So nowadays, you'd, for this um, qualification, you'd have to go to university full time for three years before going into the labs. But in those days, you kind of trained on the job. So I was based in the labs and attended lectures as well. Um, my first lab that I went into, so I was straight from school, I was in histology. And I arrived first day in histology, bright eyed, and they told me I was going to be in the post mortem lab. So I went straight from school to the mortuary, and I enjoyed it quite a lot. Um, so, for the first two years of this qualification, you, we had to rotate through the four labs and go to lectures and sit exams, and including chemistry, which I'd never done at school. And so, it was quite, quite a steep learning curve. I absolutely hated it. I couldn't see the point in knowing how carbon atoms were joined together. But we got through the exam with that, and I did. Um, and after two years, you had to choose which lab you were going to specialize in, and I chose to specialize in hematology. So I sent a, spent another two years there studying hematology and working in the lab. And 1981 was quite a big year. It was the year I got married to Martin, who's sitting there in the front row. Um, and then I turned 21 while we were on honeymoon with the dog. And it was also the year I qualified in haematology. Then in 1984, we had Claire. And in 86, we had Mike, who's here tonight. Unfortunately, Claire couldn't come because she lives in Dunedin. Um, so yes, when I had Claire, I resigned from full-time work. But we needed the money, so I did go back. Um, part-time and I locumed at Krutsky Hospital, I locumed for private pathologists. I got involved in two research projects, um, so I did a few mornings a week doing the lab work for those projects. And then in 1990, the year Claire started school, I took a position in a high school as a laboratory technician. And I stayed there for six years until 1996 when we immigrated to New Zealand. So it was quite a big move for us. We didn't have jobs to come to. We just sold our house, resigned from our jobs, packed up, and decided to leave. We thought, well, we'll pick berries if we have to. Um, and we had my brother-in-law and sister who'd been in New Zealand. They immigrated here when I was still in high school. So we had them, and so we had some family here. And we were lucky that Within six weeks of us arriving in December 1996, Martin got a job at a company called Switch Tech here in Christchurch. So I didn't have to go and pick berries. And you can see in this picture, we've got our first New Zealand dog, Katie the Dachshund. So I've always had dogs ever since I was born. I've loved dogs. And the ones on the left are our pack we had just before we emigrated. Um, four dogs and a cat who thought he was a dog. And the ones on the right are present for babies, Ragnar and Alice. And also what I like doing outside of work is lawn bowls. And this picture was taken in January when our team had just won the, um, the sevens final, the championship, Canterbury Championship sevens final. And we were supposed to go and play for a national title in April, but COVID put pay to that. So we're going to have to try our best to get to the same position this season. And for those of you who think you're too young to play bowls, please note that four of our team are in their 20s. But you'll be relieved to know that I finally got to the sex work bit. <laughs> so a lot of people ask me how I got into doing research in sex work. And I think sometimes I think that I'm a bit of an enigma to the people in the medical school. Um, but I think it was an accident. I didn't, I didn't purposely decide I was going to. Uh, sex work actually chose me. So I said we didn't have jobs when we arrived in the country. I applied for everything I saw in the paper that I thought I could possibly do, not sex work, but I <laughs> applied for, for a lot of jobs. 
And one of them was for this research assistant in the um, public health and general practice at the School of Medicine. And I thought it didn't have any information about what the research was about. Um, but I thought, well, I've worked in a medical school and I've done research, so I'm perfectly suited for this job. So I went off and I got, I got an interview and I went off to the interview and it was in um, Cambridge Terrace, that's where the department was located, um, uh, where me here are now. And um, the, the interview panel was Professor Jane Chetwind, who was at that stage head of department, and Dr Libby Plumridge, who was the PI on the research, and Dr Ruth Helms, who was our department administrator. And it was there that I found out what the research was about. They said, well, it was located in the public health side of the department. And it was looking at the safer sex in the Christchurch sex industry. And the research involved a survey and interviews with sex workers. So inside I was thinking, well, I don't think I can say anything intelligent about public health. And neither could I say anything intelligent about sex work. And I didn't know that social research methods was a thing. So, but I said, that's interesting. <laughs> and we got through the interview, in, including the test I had to do on Word, which Ruth sent, set for me. And Ruth, I've got to make a um, confession, uh, said that you had to be proficient in Word, but I'd only used Word Perfect in South Africa, so I didn't know Word. So when I was called for an interview, I had four days with a manual on how to do Word, <laughs> and I did enough to pass that test. <laughs> Um, so yes, so I started here at the school in 1997, knowing absolutely nothing about public health, even less about sex work, but I improved. I did um, learn a lot. I did, as David said, I did the postgraduate diploma in public health and the masters and the PhD in public health. And I did a lot more research on sex work. So I've landed up here in 2020 as a professor in public health and seen as a world expert in sex work research. So I thought I'd take you on the journey of um, some of the, of the studies that I've done around sex work. Um, I have done other research, but I'm not going to talk about those today. And before we get to those, I just want to say that I've, I take a community-based participatory research approach to all my research. So um, traditional methods, traditional research methods, the researcher kind of poses the problem, what they want to research, they go about doing the research, they analyse, look at their findings, and they might make um, recommendations on where to from there. But a participatory approach kind of turns that on its head. It starts from the bottom up, and it sees that the community needs to actually identify the problems that are important for them to have research done on. So if you look at a lot of public health research that's done around sex work, most of it is done on sexual health because a lot of researchers see that as the most important issue for sex workers. But when you talk to sex workers, that's not the most important thing. There's a whole lot of other things which are far more important than sexual health. In fact, they're really good at, at ensuring their sexual health. So I've worked with NZPC um, all the, the way along the line in all the research. So work with them, I, I'm guided by Catherine, Dame Catherine Healy is luckily with us today. She was um, one of the co-founders of NZPC. And we've got Sue here as well from the Christchurch branch. So thank you very much for coming. So yes, um, a lot of, all of the time really, I'm guided by NZPC as to what the issues are I need to be doing research on. And then working with them through the whole research process, through all the stages, so that I know that I'm, right, I'm asking the right questions in the research. Um, I also, once I've done the analysis, I give it to Catherine, who looks at it. Often she's got a different perspective, a different take on it, which then I can incorporate into um, what I write up. And also it's about finding out from sex workers what they think will work if there's going to be an intervention, whether it's a policy, whether it's a health promotion initiative, that we know that once that's put in place, it's grounded in the knowledge and the experience of sex workers. So it's going to be therefore more acceptable to sex workers and therefore more effective. So on many of the slides, when I introduce the studies, you'll see this logo at the bottom. So this is recognised internationally as the symbol to end violence against sex, work, sex workers. Um, 
And this is um, NZPC's logo, and they've Kiwi-fired it by incorporating the silver fern into the red umbrella. And I put it on the slides because this is not just me doing the research, this is a partnership, and this recognises that this is research that we um, have done together. Um, so yes, I'm going to go through the studies. I can't, the eight studies I want to cover, and I can't actually go into detail about all of them. Some of them had quite a lot of findings. So I'm just going to pick one key public health message, take home message for you from each of these studies. So the start of my journey was that study that um, Libby Plumridge uh, led, um, and it was funded by the Health Research Council looking at safer sex in the Christchurch sex industry, and I might need to just get my notes here in case I get lost. Um, so the context for this was that sex work in New Zealand was still criminalised at that time. Um, but NZPC were campaigning for decriminalisation. And Libby and Jane had engaged with NZPC towards the beginning of the 1990s when they did some studies um, on clients of sex workers. But, I th um, but NZPC also you know, were wanting some research which would give some indication of the state of play, what was happening in sex work in the country at that time, um, that they could use maybe in their arguments for decriminalisation. So we did the study, it was quite a, um, we did a survey of 303, I think it was, sex workers in Christchurch, which was at that stage about 80% of the sex worker population at that time. And we did interviews with 32 sex workers longitudinally, so multiple interviews here in Christchurch and in Wellington. Um, uh, so some, some people were interviewed up to five times in an 18 month period. So one of the questions that we asked uh, around in the survey was around adverse experiences sex workers had had in their time in sex work. And as you can see by these um, figures on this table, it's quite, the prevalence is quite high. Um, and it's especially high for street-based sex workers um, compared to indoor workers. And they experience more and more severe forms of violence. We know that street-based sex workers are more vulnerable to violence. But the thing is, when the sex work was criminalised, none of these events got reported to the police because sex workers would not report to the police because then they'd be outing themselves as being involved in illegal activities. And when we asked them about um, reporting to the police, they also said the police wouldn't care and they, would also, and they said the police would blame them and say they put themselves in, that, themselves in that position. And police were seen as the enemy. There was entrapment going on, so it was illegal to solicit, by the way. So you couldn't ask for money for sex, but it wasn't illegal to offer money for sex. So there's a bit of a double standard that was going on there. Um, but police would then pose as clients to try and entrap sex workers into asking for money. They also seized condoms as evidence of prostitution-related activities. Um, so yes, when very few, um, the relationship between police and sex workers was not good and very few incidents were reported. And if we look in the brothels, there was a lot of exploitation going on there. There was, uh, brothel operators were charging shift fees of sex workers, regardless of whether they got a client or not. So sometimes they, they actually lost money by going into work. They were fined for minor offences, like having a ladder in their stocking being late, so their take-home money was often very small. They, had, they could not refuse to see a client if they'd had a bad experience with that client before. If they knew that person from their personal life, they were not allowed to refuse. Um, and they had very little say over what services they could, they would provide. And I'll just pause when I put up quotes so I can have a drink of water and you can read the quote. So yeah, and, and brothel operators sometimes would want to try out new sex workers, didn't pay them, and sometimes didn't use a condom either. So really the message that I'm giving you here is that criminalization creates um, creates an uh, environment where um, exploitation can happen because people are safe in the knowledge that they can do what they like and sex workers will not report it. So they can get away with it. 
The study finished in 1999, and it was about the same time that um, NZPC had finished writing the Prostitution Reform Bill. So the Prostitution Reform Bill was written by sex workers for sex workers, was tidied up by a professor of law at Victoria University. Um, and it was quite brief, really. And Tim Barnett submitted it to Parliament in 2000 as a private member's bill, and he spoke to it in all three readings. And he drew on some of the evidence from the study to argue that the problem, uh, that sex work in and of itself is not the problem. It's not a problem. It's the laws that criminalise sex work that create the problems. The criminalisation creates um, the harms. And so he used this min um, harm minimisation argument and um, uh, a social justice argument in Parliament. And the vote, final vote happened in 2003, so the bill was in Parliament for three years. It went and underwent a number of amendments. The MPs couldn't keep their fingers out of it. Mm. And it grew and grew and grew, so it's quite a substantial document now. And some of those additions, amendments that were made to the bill have been quite contentious, and I'll talk about one later on in the, in the talk. Um, but the final vote came in in um, June 2003, and 60 MPs voted for, 59 against, and one abstention. So uh, sex work was decriminalised by a very narrow margin, and we became the first country in the world to decriminalise. New South Wales had done so in 1995, but it's the only it was the only state in Australia to decriminalise. And then last year, Northern Territory did, but we remain the only country to have decriminalised. So some people get a bit confused and say, well, what about the Netherlands and Germany? But actually, that they are legalised, not decriminalised, and there's a big difference there. So decriminalisation is where you get rid of all the laws which criminalise sex workers' activities, and basically it runs under the same conditions as any other occupation. It's a business like any other, ostensibly. Um, whereas legalisation, it's only legal if you're working in a legal brothel. So if you're working privately, if you're working on the street, if you're working in an unlicensed brothel, you're still criminalised. So that's the difference between legalisation and decriminalisation. So anyway, after it was decriminalised, the, er, the emphasis then was, well, did it work? Was decriminalisation a harm minimisation um, strategy? And were sex workers now better off after decrim? So I applied as a, the PI, I was the PI on the study, and the co-investigators were Lisa Fitzgerald, who's now at the University of Queensland, and Dr Cheryl Brunton, who's still in the department. And we put in um, for funding to the Health Research Council again, and they funded it. Um, and within a few weeks of us getting this funding, I got a call from the Ministry of Justice. And they wanted to have a talk, because one of the amendments that went into the Act was that um, the Act was required to be evaluated within five years of enactment. Now, very few policies get enacted with that proviso, that um, evaluation proviso. So they had set up a prostitution law review committee under the Ministry of Justice, but they now needed some research to do their evaluation. And they wanted to, they had, very, they had four task areas they needed to cover, and they wanted to talk to us to see, well, what parts of, would our research cover all or some of those tasks that they had to do? So in our talks with them and the Law Review Committee, we found out that we could, we could inform three of the tasks they had. So um, they contracted us to provide a report to the, the Review Committee with, by 2007. Only trouble was our HRC money was to cover the research in Christchurch, Wellington, Napier and Nelson. And obviously they wanted Auckland involved because that's where the largest population of sex workers are. So the Ministry of Justice topped up. They gave us extra money to extend the data collection to Auckland. So it was a very large study. We did a survey of 772 sex workers and we did in-depth interviews with 58 sex workers. And we also did an estimation of the number of workers. So that was one of the things in the Prostitution Reform Act a lot of MPs thought that you decriminalise and everybody would want to come and work in the industry and it would just expand exponentially. So they wanted that, we had to do an estimation at the time 
that uh, decriminalisation came into be, and then one five years down to the track to see if the numbers had increased. So we did that as well. So I won't talk, talk, talk too much about the study because I'll embellish it on, on it in future ones, but just to say that um, that sex workers, uh, that the sex work had changed dramatically. Um, it created a, a safer environment where sex workers were able to negotiate what, what services they would provide, uh, condom use far easier than they could prior to that. Um, they could refuse to see clients. They didn't have to see clients they didn't want to see. They could respond to exploitative practices in brothels. Um, their relationship with the police in, um, improved and there were no increase in numbers. Our estimation um, showed that there had been a bit of a movement, so there were fewer sex workers in brothels and more working privately, but overall numbers were pretty much the same as they were um, prior to decriminalisation. And the reason why I think decriminalisation minimised harm was because sex workers' rights were recognised. And I'll just let you read that quote. So the, we provided the report to the Prostitution Law Review Committee and their conclusion for looking at that research and other bits of research that they had done was that sex workers were far safer under decriminalisation than they had been before and that there had been no negative outcomes from decriminalisation. So what fell out of also that study was um, in the Prostitution Reform Act, they, there was a statement about exiting the sex industry and that um, we needed to assess the nature and adequacy of the means available to assist persons to avoid or cease working as sex workers. This is quite a judgmental statement that they had in the Prostitution Reform Act. It makes it sound like sex workers need to be saved from the sex industry. And we know that um, most of the sex workers I've spoken to have freely chosen to work in the sex industry. And contrary to popular opinion, a lot of them actually enjoy their work. The Prostitution Law Review Committee actually, in their recommendations, softened this and said that we need to look at the means of helping people who want to leave the sex industry. So this is what sort of um, was the impetus for doing this piece of research, which I got funding from the uh, University of Otago Research Grant to undertake. And I, I talked to people who had left sex work. But um, in, in many cases, it's a yo-yo profession that people dip in and dip out. So really, you know, they come into work, they might go get into a personal relationship and leave for a while. When that relationship ends, come back. Sometimes they have a bad experience and leave, then come back, or just want a break. So people, the people I spoke to have been in, in and out a few times from sex work. But there are two messages I want to give from this, um, from this study. Firstly, there are wider structural issues at play outside of sex work um, that, that influence entry into sex work. So poverty is a driver for sex work, um, and sex workers can earn more money and have more flexible hours than a lot of other jobs that they could have. Um, and money was always the reason for people coming back to sex work. So for instance, this participant said this. Most sex workers are women and most are vulnerable to poverty. Uh, many women in New Zealand are in low paid female dominated occupations. Um, and there's still a gender pay gap. And New, uh, New Zealand's not unique in that single parent families um, are at the bottom end of the scale in terms of earnings and overall assets. And sex workers are often single parent families and they choose sex work in the face of very few other um, economic um, choices. The second uh, message I want to give is around stigma. Stigma is a determinant of health. When sex work was decriminalised, it didn't change societal attitudes. So there's still a stigma attached to sex work. And, this, and sex workers have to contend with this 
um, in their everyday lives and it has huge implications for their social and mental well-being. So stigma um, leads to discrimination and when you're wanting to leave sex work and you're wanting to get a job elsewhere, how do you explain the hole in your CV? So very few people would put in that they've been working in sex work because the reality is that they probably wouldn't even get an interview. So sex work kind of follows you out of, out of, sex, uh, out of sex work. Um, stigma follows you out of sex work. Um, and I'll put up that quote. So you don't leave the stigma behind when you leave. So these are, these are structural and societal issues and it's not issues with sex work itself. The next study also kind of fell out of the um, larger impact of the PRA study. And for this one, I teamed up with um, Associate Professor Stephanie Wehab, who at that stage was in the Department of Sociology, Gender Studies and Social Work in Dunedin. And she was from Portland, Oregon, and she's since gone back there. And she, had, was, this, um, she uh, was an academic um, social worker. She had done um, a lot of work around street-involved youth in the, um, in the States. And I was also particularly interested in this because when I looked at the demographics around street-based sex work, um, we found that 29% of street-based sex workers had started um, on the street prior to the age of 16, and a further 28% had started between the ages of 16 and 17. So that's 57% of street-based sex workers have started sex work before the age of 18. And the vast majority of those sex workers have been in foster care or in the child, youth and family system. And I use SIFS because that was what it was called in, um, at this time. I know it's Oranga um, Tamariki now. So, a lot of the, the young people had been in foster care, they'd run away from foster care, landed up in the street, and they were selling sex to survive. And another group that, of young people are transgender young people who've known from a very early age that they're in the wrong body, and it's mainly, mainly male to female transgender. And they've been bullied at school, and, um, and often parents don't accept their gender identity, and they end up running away they find other people on the street like them and they form quite strong bonds um, there. And their relationship with, um, with social workers is, is quite fraught. So we did interviews with young people on the street and we also did interviews with social workers. And what we found was there really needs to be institutional shifts here. The young people were really angry they said that they had no say in it. They were taken away from families. They understood and they were angry with their families. They said that you know, they weren't the greatest families, but it was their family. And they were taken away often and put in a, a foster care family who were often no better than their own family. So hopefully you can read that. And they were quite perceptive, these young people. They recognised that um, it wasn't necessarily the social workers, it was the SIFS system, which had very rigid um, guidelines. And the social workers we spoke to reinforced this. They said, you know, that it's a really risk-averse risk environment, that um, if there's any risk involved, the, the default position is to take the child away. And in a way, they've... It's, it's, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, really, because if they know that a child's at risk and they don't remove the child and something happens, then it's them that have to wear the blame. But these young people recognised it, and they, um, and they argued that things needed to be... Uh, they, they needed to give more weight to what the young people themselves felt. They felt that they weren't being heard, that um, social workers didn't listen to what they had to say, and... Um, Basically, there was very little relationship between them and social workers because the case workers changed so often, they never actually developed a relationship with any of the social workers. <laughs> 
So what I'm saying here is that it's similar to the previous study I talked about. These are wider structural issues, and this is an organisational issue, that there needs to be shifts within the organisation. We're still talking about it now that it's a rangatamariki, if you watch the news nowadays. Um, nothing really has changed much. The next study we wanted to look at employment in the sex industry again. Um, so we wanted to look at brothels, um, explore the practices in brothels and um, whether things had moved on now that um, decriminalisation was well embedded and got a York to do this study. Uh, well, no, it was an Otago Medical School grant that I got. And we did interviews with brothel operators and with um, sex workers. And I will just want to focus on one section that was added to the PRA here, that's section 16, which says that you cannot compel anybody to provide a commercial sexual service. And sex workers and brothel operators know the PRA quite well. And so, um, you know, most, um, most sex workers who work in brothels work on shifts. And so if they don't feel like coming in on a shift, sometimes the... Um, the brothel operator will want to find them to recoup some of the advertising costs, etc. Um, but sex workers being quite clued up are now saying, well, you can't do that. That's not legal. So there's been this kind of power shift within brothels. So whereas brothel operators had all the power in the criminalised environment, some, there's been this power shift. And now sex workers um, don't have to put up with what are, and, and brothel operators are saying that it's very difficult to run a business. So if you're expecting five people to work on a shift and three people say they're not going to come, you know, you don't have sex workers there. And you've also put in, out quite a lot of money in advertising. So, um, yeah. NCPC often play a mediating role between sex workers and um, brothel operators. And failing that, there's also the Human Rights Tribunal, and some sex workers have taken um, operators and successfully to the Human Rights Tribunal. Um, but again, stigma comes into play here as well. You can apply for name suppression, because a lot of sex workers don't tell family and friends that they're working, so they don't really want their name out there. So they can apply for name suppression, it's always granted, but there's that faint thought that maybe it won't be granted this time. And so that threat to kind of um, that being exposed as working in the sex industry sometimes prevents people from going further up in the, um, through the courts. So yeah, decriminalisation has led to um, labour rights, but it's just that stigma kind of still sitting there, which sometimes impedes them achieving those rights. The next one we did, well, when I first started doing research, most sex workers advertised in the newspaper in the adult section of the classifieds and was sort of one or two lines, but things have changed somewhat. And most sex workers now will advertise online their web platforms that they can advertise on. And we were wondering about whether this would introduce new and different harm. Um, so we thought we'd um, do a study on this, and I, I'd never heard of Internet in New Zealand until then, but I found them, and they funded research, and they funded this piece of research, which was very nice. Um, so what we found that was sex workers had really actively engaged in marketing, and they could market themselves two ways, through the photos that they used on the websites, and also through the blurb that they wrote. So now they had a bigger space to write and um, market themselves. Um, and they pro could provide more detail, but the thing is there's a lot of competition online. And if you don't pay the premium price of about $170 a week, you're not going to be on those top pages and those web, on those web platforms. And you sink down, somehow you've got to stand out from, from the rest. So there's been a growing pressure for sex workers to show their faces in these photos. So mostly now people are sort of cut off at the neck or strategically placed so that their face isn't visible, um, tattoos are sort of uh, airbrushed out and so on, no identifying information. But now there's this pressure, you're going to, if you show your face, you're going to more likely um, get clients. The danger here is that there's facial recognition 
software around. And people can um, use that to find their private Facebook sites and find out what their real name is, get into their personal networks. And so there have been um, episodes of online harassment and stalking, threats to privacy through use of personal information. So yes, there's internet has changed the face of sex work and we have to deal with those new problems that, that this might um, bring. Uh, one of the um, amendments made to that, which I think was the most damaging, was the addition of section 19 into the Act, which stated that you couldn't, migrants couldn't come into the country on temporary visas, um, temporary work or student visas and work in the sex industry. So in effect, only New Zealand residents and citizens can work in, illegally in this country. And this part of uh, this section was put in because there was a fear by some MPs that once it was decriminalised, it would encourage trafficking into the country. I don't know what that was based on, but there was this fear of trafficking. And um, I, was, um, I worked with Dr Michael Roguski, who's a private researcher in Wellington. He and I were contracted by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment to look at the experiences of migrant workers in this country. And what did we find? We found, yeah, we spoke to several migrant workers here. Some of them didn't want to speak because obviously very nervous. If they're found to be working, they can be deported. So some were nervous to talk to us. We spoke to, but we found some who would talk to us. And we spoke to um, people who support um, migrant workers here as well. And they were being horribly exploited because, um, yeah, it, it was similar to how it was when sex work was criminalised for other sex workers here, in that um, people could blackmail them, require them to provide services they didn't want to provide, not pay them, some clients don't, didn't pay, some brothel operators withheld money, and some, sex, some migrant workers were raped. And again, none of them would report it to the police because of fear of being deported. So that section of the Act has introduced quite a lot of harm the unintended consequences of policy. Um, those sex workers who could speak English pretty well and were white were less affected because they could work in brothels and if people asked them about their accent, they could say, oh, I've been here a number of years, I'm a citizen. It was those sex workers who couldn't speak English and were obviously not um, from this country that were... Uh, particularly disadvantaged and they were quite well hidden and vulnerable. So it highlights the unintended consequences of policy. It was, this is the only occupation that's picked out that migrants can't come and work in. There are trafficking laws. We have never, we've had no evidence of sex work trafficking in this country. The only case that has come to the courts for trafficking has been in the horticultural industry. But yet sex work remains. There are trafficking laws, there was no need to put the section in, and we have been arguing for quite some time that it should be um, amended and removed from the Prostitution Reform Act. And this is the last one I, want to study, uh, I wanted to talk about, and um, it's quite a, a, a long way. I'm going to try and abbreviate it because it uh, gets quite involved. It, the impetus for this study came about because of tensions between street-based sex workers and residents or business owners around the areas that they work in. So we wanted to do a, um, an action-based sort of study to form a, a group to look at research results, um, a group of people or people involved to look at the research and come up with options to ease the tensions. So it was a community engagement type of um, research. And we interviewed, and for this we got funding from lotteries, and we interviewed um, sex workers, we interviewed residents and business owners, we interviewed council staff and councillors, uh, uh, and outreach workers. Have I left anybody out? Don't think so. So we interviewed all of them, and our aim was to bring representatives from all, all kinds of stakeholders into a group to 
to discuss how we could relieve these tensions. So this was particularly in Auckland and, and Christchurch that we've had this happen. And I'm going to just concentrate on Christchurch. After the earthquake, you know, most street based sex workers work in Manchester Street, between sort of um, Litchfield Street, they work between Litchfield Street and Beely Ave, sort of. But when the earthquake happened and the cordons came up, uh, the, they couldn't work, they were sort of displaced from their normal place of work. And some of them moved across Beely Ave into a middle class suburb in Man Manchester Street, nor um, north of. Um, Believ, and this didn't. This was uh, quite a shock to the residents there, um, and they they were rightfully upset. I think because there was a lot of um, noise at night and in the early hours of the morning, people were finding used needles in their hedges. Their gardens were used as toilets and uh, various other things, and. Um, when the residents complained to the police, the police would say, it's decriminalised, we can't do anything. And when they complained to the council, the council said, it's decriminalised, we can't do anything. And they got quite hit up about it. And eventually some of the residents employed a lawyer. And that's when the council started to think, well, maybe we'll, we'll have a bylaw and we'll just zone sex work somewhere else. Um, problem is somebody's got to enforce that. And as I said before, some policy just doesn't work, so sex workers might not move. So what's going to happen then? Are they going to fine them? That means they're going to come out on the street and work more in order to pay the fine. And um, then they talked about, well, making the areas, so making no-go zones in particular areas, which also we thought wouldn't work that well. Um, so we worked in, the, in this group to try and find more... Um, acceptable solutions. The, I think the council members on that group kind of came around to the way of thinking that yeah, bylaws weren't the way to go, but the councillors themselves who had to vote on it were still quite fixed on a bylaw. And we thought that was the way it was going to go. And then the day before the council meeting, the police said, well, if you make a bylaw, we're not going to enforce it. So the council then decided, well, they couldn't do that. So they allowed the community engagement to carry on for another year to see if we could find an acceptable solution to everybody. And just to cut a long story short, we did. And thanks to Sue's sterling efforts um, there, we, within a few months, had solved the problem and um, street-based street sex workers were moved back across um, uh, it took some time, it took some time convincing sex workers that, you know, because they got quite used to working in the suburb and liked it there, had to kind of re-educate them and tell them why it was important that they moved and um, eventually that happened. So, yeah, the, the often regulation is the knee-jerk reaction and um, bylaws just um, would have created a lot more problems than... Um, and wouldn't have really solved the ones that they had. And community engagement, not regulation, is often the way to go. And I really like this quote from one of the council staff members. So you can come up with mutually satisfactory outcomes without resorting to regulations. It just takes time and a different way of working. Uh, I, was, I have been involved in two Canadian Institutes of Health Research. They were purely Canadian-based studies, so I'm not going to talk about them. And as um, David mentioned, we've just been funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK to do a comparative study um, working with some of the top names in um, sex work research. So uh, Professor Jane Schooler from Strathclyde in Glasgow, Professor Tila Sanders from University of Leicester in England, uh, Professor Graham Ellison from Queen's University in Belfast, and Professor Barbara Brents from University of Nevada in the States. So we've all got different ways of the, um, in which sex work is regulated. So England and Scotland, it's partially criminalised. Ireland, they criminalise the clients and other third parties. Nevada, they've got legalisation in certain brothels outside of Las Vegas. And here, obviously, we're um, 
we decriminalise. So we're interested in the issue of consent and how people see consent and how that plays out in terms of reporting of sexual violence for sex workers and how, and, um, how it also plays out through the, the, um, the legal process. So we are going to start that study in June next year. We delayed it slightly because of COVID. So I'd like to acknowledge the University of uh, Otago. It's been a wonderful place to work and been really supportive of my career. I particularly want to thank Professor Les Toop, who was my HOD for many years, who was particularly supportive, especially over um, a time in the early 2000s, which were quite unsettling, and I don't think I would have been here today without his support. I'd like to um, thank the funding bodies that uh, research is always difficult to get, and I think it's a little bit even more difficult to get research um, and funds for sex, sex work research. But I'm really grateful to these um, funders for supporting the research. But the biggest thank you goes to NZPC, um, who've been my wonderful partners and friends in all the research that I've done, and I really couldn't have done any of the research without them. So thank you very much. Um, all the roads that I used on my journey were free downloads from the internet, but I've had to attrib attribute them here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you are interested in reading more about sex work in New Zealand, uh, the book on that side is our 2010 book, Taking the Crime Out of Sex Work, which gives more details about how we got a decriminalisation in this country and the research just after that. And the other one, this one on this side, has just come out a couple of months ago. Um, I co-edited this book with Lindsay Armstrong, who's a criminologist in Victoria University of Wellington. And that's more recent research that's come out in se around sex work in New Zealand. Um, both of these books are, I believe, available in the Central Library in Dunedin. So, so Kia ora, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Julian, for walking us through the core of your research career and congratulations on reaching the professoriate. Aside from Gillian's strong general, general intellectual contribution to research, both locally and internationally, on sex work, there are two things that stand out in terms of social science and public health impact. Gillian's mentioned both of these, but I think they bear some reinforcement. The first of these is to do with the policy relevance of her work, and the second is to do with the methodology that she's used, so that participatory approach that she's taken. Firstly, to policy relevance. Many researchers would love to contribute to evidence-based policy. Many researchers fail to do so, through no fault of their own, but often to do with lack of political will. Gillian, working together with the Prostitutes Collective and a coalition of others, has contributed to building evidence-based policy around sex work. This work culminated in the Prostitution Reform Act, which most would agree with the caveats that Gillian mentioned, has actually improved the lives of sex workers. So it's no small thing. Another striking feature of the collaboration between Gillian and the Prostitutes Collective is their proactive effort to conduct research in, in terms of evaluating the impact of the Prostitution Reform Act. This work helps to dispel some of the myths that propagated around what would follow on from that act. It's relatively unusual for policy to be evaluated. It would be great if more of it were to be so. So this is quite unusual. With regard to method methodology, and Gillian's already talked about this, she spent decades working with the Prostitutes Collective. Again, many social scientists aspire to work in participatory ways with community groups to, in order to affect change and improve outcomes for those groups. Examples of close, sustained and effective collaboration are relatively rare. 
and it's a testament to both Gillian and the Prostitutes Collective that they've sustained this relationship over time. I want to finish on that note and actually invite Dame Catherine Healy from the Prostitutes Collective to say a few words. Um, kia ora katu katoa. It's an honour and a privilege to be here, Gillian. And I didn't envisage 20 years on from meeting you, probably in a smoke, you know, filled room, um, which we'd probably tried to clear before you arrived, um, that we would be here today acknowledging you. I mean, research has come and go, and certainly sex work has become um, a little bit popular. But if I reflect, you know, on the decades as I can now, um, we are indeed truly honoured to have that longevity in terms of our relationship. It's very easy to open the door and it's very easy to close it. And, and then many, many, many doors that we had to open, that you opened, to get into the heart of our communities. And that is impressive. I don't, you know, I really want to underscore that because at any point in time you could have burnt it off. Um, you were so subtle, you are so subtle, you've got all this in incredible integrity. Sitting alongside me, behind me, I've got, you know, millions of stilettos up my back. <laughs> and if, if, you know, if you can appreciate, and I know that you do, you know, the critics pile in when papers are written, when research is released, the media, you know, will stomp all over it. And you've had these experiences and you've sailed through and you've managed each of these contentious issues with great expertise. And, you know, look, I, I just can't thank you enough for the depth and the body of research that you've brought, not only to us. I know that parliamentary committees in all sorts of countries. Most recently I was talking to sex workers in Moscow and we were talking able. You know, I can tell you that I've heard your name said in so many different accents. And of course, you know, I pull you out as the weapon. <laughs> I had an entrepreneur on the phone this morning and he wanted to, to know something. He didn't want to tell much, but he was developing some big thing that was secret. It was a commercial thing. So I'm sharing, not his idea, but you know, <laughs> his idea, he was trying to pull information from us. And I was saying, well, you know, have you read Abel's research? So, you know, you're always relevant. Your relevance is going to be with us for a very, very long time. And I thank you. I know that universities award um, honorary doctorates. I would love to award you something from the sex industry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Gillian. That was a fantastic lecture, if I may say so personally. And it's always nice to see research with impact, changing people's lives. It's fantastic. So congratulations to you. And to complete the formalities, can I thank you all for coming tonight to join us in, in this very special event and invite you to join us for some refreshments upstairs to the left. Thank you very much indeed.